on this Sunday night. The culture of silence is not a good one. And we have to help kids understand that they, if they see something that is wrong, they need to report. Another victim, more video, and now an independent investigation. A Toronto private boys school rocked by allegations of student violence and sexual assault. I speak with the principal of St. Michael's College. Because of the postal strike, uh, you're not guaranteed to get your, your gifts. You've got less mail. With no end in sight for rotating strikes at Canada Post, some Canadians are changing their holiday buying habits. Plus, the skyrocketing music career of Canada's Alessia Carr. And I wanted to just use my voice to say something. How she turned her pop sound into a music message. This is The National. Horrendous, offensive, and unacceptable. That is how the administration of St. Michael's College describes incidents of alleged physical and sexual assault inside their school. The disturbing allegations of attacks caught on video and widely shared came to light this week and have rocked the community. Tonight, another shock. The principal of that school, Greg Reeves, tells The National there are now at least four victims and he received a third video of an incident just this morning. That video is now in the hands of Toronto police who say they are reviewing it. If appropriate, they will start an investigation. In the face of all that, St. Michael's College School announced today it's launching an independent investigation. So today the principal broke his silence, speaking for the first time since the story came to light. He, of course, has been facing criticism over the school's handling of the alleged attacks and the school's timeliness in reporting them to police. I met with Greg Reeves earlier today and began by asking about what happened and when. How many incidents are we talking about? And, and roughly what happened? So Monday morning, the first video came into our possession and we, this is now an incident with the bathroom. The video only showed one victim, but upon our investigation, we found there was two. So at that point, we did the investigation. I phoned the parents, I set up expulsion meetings and I phoned Sergeant Smith in Division 13 to let him know what was happening. So then Monday night, um, I was here late um, and uh, a second video then came into my possession. It was horrific. So at that point I had expulsion meetings to protect the first two victims uh, the next morning and we couldn't, I didn't know who was in the video at that point so we couldn't get to it until Tuesday at noon. Once we identified who was in the video, we immediately pulled them uh, out of class and began uh, to interview each one of them. So how many victims now and how many perpetrators do you think? Um, from my perspective, um, we have expelled eight and suspended one. This morning, uh, I received another video, but uh, I forwarded it immediately. So I have no information what's on that video and I don't know if it's a duplicate or what it is. So I forwarded it to the investigators. Did you see it? Did you no. look at it? No. Because now it's a police investigation. So you're talking four victims now? I have, I know of four. Four victims, okay. Y your hesitation is because po you think it's possible police might have uncovered more. I, I, I'm worried that there is more. There is still a fair amount of concern out there amongst Canadians that it took a, a matter of days to actually alert the police. Why did it take so long to call okay. the cops? So I understand I'm under some critique for that. I have had this discussion with the victim's parents and in my judgment the best way to protect their son at that moment of that time that's why we used the timeline we did. It's important that they are pleased. So I'm willing to take that hit because they're telling me he's healing faster because of the way we managed it. So I'm okay with that. If no one in that circle felt comfortable going to the staff or the leadership of that school, what does that say to you about the relationship you have with these students? Well, you know, it, it sounds awful, doesn't it? I mean, the way you're putting it. But the reality is 
most of the students have terrific relationships with staff and faculty here. In this, and, and I know that the boys involved here also admire uh, their teachers and coaches and so forth. So I'm going to let the police investigate to see how this turns out and then we're going to have to do a deep dive right away into that to find out what is going on here and why is that. I mean, we have to do better. So you've heard from the principal of St. Michael's College. Let's turn now to a former student who says he still suffers from his time there. The CBC's Natalie Danowski has his story and a note. We're withholding his identity because he says he's still afraid. I was bullied from pretty much the time I entered the school till the time I left. We're calling him John. He went to St. Mike's, but we can't tell you his real name because even after 15 years, he says he fears repercussions. So what was your reaction when you heard the news? Um, I wasn't surprised at all because I think that's just part of their culture. There were tons of like hazing incidents, bullying incidents. There was this incident where someone got tied to a football pole naked. Violent and embarrassing events that he says staff and teachers knew about but did nothing. There was one incident where my my mom went to complain to the school and the principal's response was, boys will be boys, these things happen. And he said that I was lucky I didn't go complain myself because it would be made things worse for me. CBC News spoke with current students who told us that hazing is very much a part of St. Mike's culture. They wouldn't go on camera fearing they could be targeted for speaking out. But they told us that one of the victims was bullied for weeks leading up to the alleged sexual assault that was caught on tape. The school tells us that victim and the three others are all getting help. But John fears that like him, they may have some lasting trauma. I think it had a long term effect. I was when I went to university, I specifically chose the university where I would separate myself from anyone I went to school with and that helped a lot but I do feel that it did have like a long-term psychological damage to me. On Tuesday St. Mike's will hold a meeting for all alumni to explain the chain of events that led to expulsions and the police investigation. The former student we spoke to says he plans to share his story of bullying and the long-term trauma it caused. He encourages other victims to do the same. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. Now you may have heard a lot of people use the word hazing to describe these alleged attacks. And while we do not know the nature or the reason for what happened, that word hazing can veil the truth. Ultimately, we're talking about sexual violence in school and team settings. Today, an expert told The National it's been on the rise in the U.S. and Canada for at least 15 years. I believe that it's now something that's almost acceptable or normed within these teams. And I think the reason is that it is the quickest way to embarrass and humiliate someone. And therefore, they're maintaining the hierarchy, which is one of the main reasons that hazing occurs. Bloomberg News concluded that more than 40 U.S. high school boys were reported sodomized with foreign objects in 2013. A decade earlier, the number was three. It's an ugly, self-reinforcing cycle, says Michael Kasdan of the Good Men Project. Those who were once victims ascend to the role of alpha males, where they get to inflict harm on a new set of victims and put their own victimhood behind them. Wash, rinse, repeat. When a New Jersey high school fired football coaches for sexual violence under their watch, boys on the team spoke out for the coaches. So how do you fix this? The top has to decide to put enough money and enough time and enough energy and decide that this is a really important, significant thing and they want to change the culture in their school. Typically, I'd like to see uh, several ways to report these kinds of hazings and um, that would be anonymously, online, offline, um, places that know how to interview kids when they get these reports, doing it appropriately. And what should you tell your kids? Probably the most important thing they can do is to tell the kids, call me. Let me know if there's anything that you feel really uncomfortable about, and you know what that is. Please call me and tell me what's going on. That's number one. The other is we have to really educate the bystanders, the kids who've already been hazed but are not yet the perpetrators, that they have a responsibility and a duty to stop this. It's hard for one person to safely intervene, but groups can be trained to stand up and say, this is wrong, stop it.
Turning now to the staring match between Canada Post and striking mail workers. Those hoping for a quick end to the rotating strikes are disappointed. The union turned down the latest contract offer last night and then countered with its own, looking for more money and more guarantees on worker safety. Postal workers are now the most injured workforce under the federal sector at five times the average. 25% of letter carriers were injured last year. This has to be fixed. As for the offer, Canada Post pitched a pay raise, better overtime pay, and a promise to create more full-time jobs. The union wanted more money and temporary worker protections. Both sides said nope, but they are committed to keep talking. So while this just drags on, holidays are getting closer, typically one of the busiest times of the year for Canada Post. Some Canadians worrying that their purchases won't get to where they're going. Others have even bigger concerns. Austin Grabish has a look at the strike's impact. All right, well, I'm having a look and nope, nothing today. Julia Michaud has been patiently checking her mail. She's not waiting for a present, she's waiting for money. The freelance graphic designer only gets paid when checks arrive in the mail, which hasn't happened in weeks. It throws a wrench into just your daily ability to just keep things running. So you have to think twice about, like I'm not um, spending, I'm not doing any kind of unnecessary spending right now. Michaud is waiting for checks to come from BC, Alberta, Ontario and the United States. With the holiday season right around the corner, some shoppers are opting for a trip to the mall. In fact, I have done some shopping online. I'm not sure when it's, I'm going to get it. So the rest of my shopping will be at the mall. The other day when I started my Christmas shopping, because of the postal strike, uh, you're not guaranteed to get your, your gifts. So, But actually, I've enjoyed getting out into the malls again, really. Eric Witkowski is happy to shop at brick and mortar stores, but the labor dispute has hit him another way. He's waiting for important medical documents to arrive sent by regular mail from his doctors for privacy reasons. Not very pleasant because whenever you have a medical need, it's a big unknown. And then you are in distress because you have something happening, possibly. It could be a good news, could be bad news. Either way, you're waiting for the news. You're under the stress. Also under stress, the Retail Council of Canada. It says mail backlogs are having a real effect on business. We've got a 60 million parcel flow coming. There is no reasonable other means of delivering that. The couriers can't handle those sorts of volumes. The council is calling on the federal government to introduce back-to-work legislation. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. Just to give you a sense of the holiday surge Canada Post deals with because of online shopping, last year, Canadians spent $1.9 billion online in December alone, up from $1.8 billion in 2016. That was expected to climb again this year, but with the strikes, we'll see. Part of the increase is due to the collapse of department store giants like Sears. Part of it is just simple demographics. Millennials typically shop online more than older Canadians. And simmering tensions over that migrant caravan from Central America really reached a boiling point today because angry protesters just took to the streets, borrowing from Donald Trump and calling it an invasion. But the thing is, the unwelcoming crowds weren't Americans. Rather, it was a group often demeaned by the U.S. president themselves, Mexicans. And as Paul Hunter discovered, they're now taking a page from Trump's playbook. Out, out, they chanted in Tijuana today. Hundreds of Mexicans angry already at the suddenly huge and growing number of migrants who've just arrived in the border city. Fleeing strife in countries south of there, the migrants, roughly 3,000 of them, seek asylum in America. But so many have arrived so quickly, Tijuana's shelters are overrun. And those intent on crossing into the U.S. properly face a lengthy wait putting names on lists to be handed to U.S. authorities for processing, which could take months. It's complicated, he says. But considering the outlook for these people in their home country was either life or death, it's a better outlook here. This, as Mexican authorities built an ad hoc barrier overnight at the border crossing into California, aimed at tightening access for all. 
as U.S. soldiers along other parts of the border, this is Laredo, Texas, continued to reinforce their barriers with razor wire. Today, Donald Trump again called it all an invasion, tweeting that the U.S. will not stand for it. They are causing crime and big problems in Mexico, he wrote, though he gave no details, adding simply, go home. For their part, migrants told reporters all they want is a better life in the U.S. Have a bit of sympathy for the children, she says. We're not thieves. We have come to work and do the jobs that the Americans don't do. But for now, they wait. Their numbers in Tijuana expected to triple within days. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. As a contrast, there have been scenes of hope and celebration in Tijuana. This weekend, seven LGBTQ couples in the caravan were married there. We'll bring you those stories a little later in our moment. We are tracking some developing stories tonight on The National, including a terrible record set in Toronto today. A man was shot and killed here in the city's 90th homicide of the year. That's the highest number ever for Toronto, breaking the record of 89 killings in 1991. And there are still six weeks left in the year. search just goes on for bodies in Paradise, California. This is an all too familiar sight as raging wildfires keep burning across the state. The officials warned the largest fire, the so-called campfire, won't be fully contained for two more weeks. Our Renee Filippone tracks developing stories for us on Sundays from Vancouver. She has more on the fire. So Renee, what is the latest? Well, Adrian, today officials say that giant campfire is not even halfway done burning yet. They say it will be November 30th at the earliest before they have it fully under control. And while crews battle the flames, survivors struggle to pick up the pieces. At this makeshift camp in Chico, California, the future for many is unclear. No one knows what to do. We're all living minute by minute out here. The campers have been told to move on but many don't have anywhere to go. Well, I'm gonna be the last to leave until everybody's gone because everybody needs help. The president traveled to California this weekend to get a first-hand look at the destruction. Donald Trump, who's been critical of how the state has handled the fires, was joined by Governor Jerry Brown. We're all gonna to work together and we'll, uh, we'll do a real job. But this is very sad to see it. Trump also met survivors who say they urged him for more government assistance. You know, there's families living on the streets that don't have anywhere to go. But there's rain coming, you know, there's kids sleeping in tents. And considering how fast the campfire has moved, some wonder what, if anything, could have been done to prevent the loss of life. Fires were moving uh, a football length, mm -hmm. 100 yards a second, and uh, the roads were very narrow. So there was no way for a lot of these people to get out. Renee, it's been really hard to follow the numbers of the missing. They go up and down. Where is it standing right now? Well, we could see an update at any time, but keep in mind just how hard it is for officials to tell exactly how many people are missing and how many may be actually safe somewhere. Now, the most recent list of 1,200 missing was generated by collecting data from phone calls to 911 and emails, and police say... It's not perfect, so now it's up to the hundreds of police officers along with coroners and anthropologists to sift through the ashes to determine just how deadly this fire was. Okay, Renee, thanks very much. You're welcome. Still ahead on The National, is buying tickets online still at your own risk? According to the Air Canada Terms and Conditions, yes it is. A Winnipeg man goes public after an error message cost him $700. As the technology behind video manipulation and outright fakes gets savvier, how do you tell what's real? The Fifth Estate investigation ahead. And we go in-depth in the Sunday interview. Ian finds out why Grammy award-winning songwriter Alessia Cara makes music with a message. I've always wanted to make a song about self-esteem and about body positivity and just a celebration of differences because I've always been insecure about certain things about myself and I know a lot of people around me have. Um, and I wanted to just use my voice to say something.
Regardless of where you shop, online or at a bricks and mortar store, you expect to get what you paid for. But that's not always the case. Everyone knows that. Tonight, as Rosa Marcatelli tells us, a Winnipeg man is going public after he was charged for a flight he says he didn't know he bought. When Claude Neblet went to book a flight on the Air Canada website, he put in all the information required, including his credit card number. But instead of getting a purchase confirmation, he got an error message. Unable to process your request, please try again later. Plans changed and he didn't try again. Normally, I get a response, a confirmation, and I get an e-ticket. This time, nothing happened. So I, I, uh, I felt it didn't go through. He didn't realize until he got his credit card statement a week later that the airline charged him $735 for the flight. He asked for a refund. The lady I spoke to, she said, uh, well, there's nothing I can do. You're going to lose your money. You had 24 hours to cancel. I said, 24 hours to cancel what? How am I going to cancel something that was not in effect. Neblet was surprised to learn that he and the millions of other Canadians who make online purchases every year are at the mercy of those long and sometimes hard to find terms of use on the websites. The ones that customers automatically agree to just by using the site. Language like use at your own risk and no guarantee the website will operate error free. Terms that protect businesses, not consumers, say experts. That's one reason e-commerce experts say companies need to do a better job of making the rules clear. Rules that may not even be enforceable. Simply falling back and saying, well, everybody does it this way isn't good enough. And I think from a company perspective, trying to engender trust online, it shouldn't be good enough either. Go Public contacted Air Canada about Neblet's situation. The airline offered him an apology, a refund, and a $200 credit. As for its website's terms of use, the airline tells us it will waive the terms if appropriate to resolve those customer issues. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Next on The National, she is Canadian, a Grammy Award winner, a multi-platinum songwriter, and just 22 years old. Ian gets a look at the surprisingly down-to-earth life of Alessia Carr. I've always been a go-getter. There's truth in every word I write. I have the side of me that's very, you know, humorous and just loves to make jokes. Also, I have these moments where I do get very emotional and very sensitive. And I can't Don't know why I can't see the sun when young should be fun. fun. And, and that is an excellent track from Alessia Cara's upcoming album. Right now, the Canadian pop star is unstoppable, netting a Grammy and topping charts. Ian Hannah Manson got a chance to speak with Cara about her success, where it all began, and where she might be going next. Find table space to stay your social grace is Alessia Cara is just 22 years old and she's already leaving her mark on the music world. Find me where the wild Raised just outside Toronto in Brampton, she started out like so many other young artists today, singing at home, posting clips online. Both your hands in the holes on my sweater. What followed was a YouTube fairy tale. A young fan showed it to her music executive father, and soon after, Kara broke through. To take over the she already has four top ten singles in the United States, and her sound often stands out from the crowd, like her hit Here, about feeling out of place at a party. Oh God, why am I here? That album led to a Juno Award and last year, the Grammy for Best New Artist, the first Canadian to ever do that. I'm shaking. Uh, I've been like pretend winning Grammys since I was a kid. Now she's set to perform at next week's Great Cup halftime show. And she's about to release her second album, The Pains of Growing. And I can't hide, cause growing pains are keeping me up at night. I met up with Alessia Cara in Toronto.
part of your story is about doing YouTube videos and one video in particular was seen by a young woman who showed her dad who is a, mm. a, a record uh, company executive. Is that story true? It is true, yeah. yeah, yeah. She was looking for, I guess her dad kind of had her looking online for talent and stuff. You know, she was very young, kind of was in with YouTube and, and social media. So she was searching um, one day and stumbled across a cover of mine of this song called Sweater Weather by The Neighborhood. And um, I had no idea that anybody was gonna even see it, but she somehow contacted me, I think through my Twitter at the time. Um, and then things kind of just happened from there. How old were you? I was 16. And so did any part of you wonder if this was a real thing or somebody, you know, just pretending that they were connected to a record company? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I even told her that. I was like, I don't know, like I have to talk to my dad because I don't know who this is. I don't know if this is real. I remember searching their website to make sure it wasn't spammed, to make sure it was credible. And once I figured out it was credible, um, to my knowledge anyway, mm -hmm. I asked my dad, like, can you please just talk to them? A lot of people wonder, and I was looking at comments online, who is she? Where is she from? What's her ethnicity? And turns out you're a kid from from Toronto. Is uh, could, do you think you could have sounded this way and have grown up anywhere, uh, or is there something about Toronto that's kind of connected to to your sound and your music? Um, I don't know. I think I, I definitely grew up listening to a lot of um, Canadian artists um, and just feeling connected to them, like Nelly Furtado, Alanis Morissette, Drake, of course, he's amazing. Um, a bunch of different Canadian musicians. So maybe. Maybe because I felt connected to them and I'm from there. And I also grew up, of course, around so many different cultures and religions and so many different kinds of people. And I think that's really opened my eyes um, to so many different things and has made me such an open-minded person. And I think that's kind of um, transitioned into my music as well because my music is very open and I try to be very inclusive with, um, with that as well. So I think who I am as a person is because of living here. Um, and in turn, that is kind of transition into the artist that I am. And the other thing about living here right now is that this is an incredible time for Canadian music. And you mentioned Drake, mm -hmm. and there's so many other artists, Justin Bieber, of course, uh, The Weeknd, Shawn Mendes. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a time, yourself, when there's been this cluster of young Canadians with the kind of, of international success that, that you guys have right now. Is there any connection between you? Do you hang out with them? Do you collaborate with them? Do you speak with them? Yes, I'm, I'm friends with a, f a few of them, of course, and um, although some of us may not necessarily talk every day, I feel so proud every time I see them on TV or hear their song on the radio. There's like a sense of just unity between all of us. I feel like they're my friends, you know, um, and I think that's because we're all from the same place, doing the same thing, around the same age. There's just a sense of like wanting to support each other, um, which is really nice, and I'm just, I'm so proud to be from here and so proud of what they're doing too. You guys are living in different places, mm -hmm. jetting around to concerts and different events and that sort of thing. Where do you connect with, with I don't know if it's Shawn Mendes or The Weeknd or Justin Bieber or Drake, how and, and when do you connect with them? Um, well, Shawn and I text all the time actually, and we see each other here and there. I mean, it's hard to be in the same place with anybody, but texting is always really great. From staying in touch with other young Canadian music stars to connecting with audiences, with songs that often carry a message. And you don't have to change a thing, the world could change its heart. No scars, see you beautiful, the stars are well beautiful. I think of a, a song like Scars, Mm. Uh, and, and the video in there, it, you know, there's another example of a song that is so different from what you would normally hear on the radio. How did that song and that video come about? And I've always wanted to make a song about self-esteem and about body positivity and just a celebration of differences because I've always been insecure about certain things about myself and I know a lot of people around me have. Um, and I wanted to just use my voice to say something. And then that kind of turned into the video years later where I, I tried very hard to make the lyrics match what was being shown and just display all different kinds of people, um, different ages, different colors, different everything, um, in hopes that people can just celebrate themselves a bit more. Some of your songs, heavy, deep emotional themes, so I thought to myself, this young woman seems so serious. <laughs> um, then I saw the video of you doing your impersonations. Oh no. And you're not always serious. Give me a Drake song. You used to call me on my, uh, you used to, you. oh I can do the dance, ready? Can you guys see this? Get a footage of this, ready? <laughs> 
<laughs> that was probably the best of all the impressions that I did. Which one know. is the real you? Are you the like kind of bubbly, comical, fun-loving person, or the deeply serious artist, or you just kind of go step between those two worlds? Um, I think they're both me. I think yeah. I think we're all everything at once. You know, um, especially me. I have the side of me that's very you know humorous and just loves to make jokes and just say stupid things that make me laugh and the two people around me laugh. Um, but then I'm also, I have these moments where I do get very emotional and very sensitive and I go through things just like everybody else. Um, it's different every day. Um, but I think that's the beauty of being a person is you can be everything at the same time, you mm. know. You are exceedingly normal. Like talking to you <laughs> now, it's just like a, a normal conversation with somebody. Yeah. You know, no indication of, of the kind of stardom that you are enjoying right now. Are there, what lessons do you have for young people, particularly young women, who might be watching right now? I would say, I mean, it's, it's hard to be a young woman in this industry. Both being a woman and being young in this industry is difficult. Um, and you're going to be facing a lot of um, opinions and a lot of voices that may not agree with yours. And that's difficult. But I think what I've learned um, throughout the time that I've been doing this is just to know when to say no and know that it's okay to say no. And I think it's so important to come out of it um, being 100% who I am, you know? When you say no, you mean in terms of do this song or this kind of video? Do you mean yeah. professionally or personally? I think both. Yeah. I think both. Um, you know, people will always try to tell you who you are, especially when you're in front of all these people. Everyone decides who you are in their own way and decides to pick you apart and tell you all the reasons they don't like you or all the reasons you should change, whether that's outside of the industry or even in the industry, you know? The entertainment world is kind of a weird place to be in sometimes, but I think standing you know, your ground. All these people are watching this, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> they know. I think I've told them a bunch of times already. They certainly do know that she isn't afraid to use her voice for more than just singing. After winning the Grammy for Best New Artist last year, there was a lot of criticism online, some of it nasty. Claims she wasn't new enough for the category and that another nominee should have won. But in a powerful Instagram post, Kara fought back. That was hard, and again, not to bring up like the whole woman card, but it, it's the truth, and you have to pull it up when when it's accurate. Um, and in this case, it just felt like, I don't know, like a lot of people will just try to tell you as a young woman that you don't deserve your success, or to try to make you feel guilty for your success. Um, and I was being made to feel like I, I took something from somebody, um, when that's never the case with other artists, especially established male artists. You don't ever really see that. So it kind of hurt, and it was unfortunate that that whole innocent dream of mine was a little tainted because I've always dreamt of you know winning that. I think a lot of people with the same dream as me would like dream of winning a Grammy one day and mm -hmm. so it felt unfortunate that I was made to feel guilty for it and I made that post because I wanted to stand up for myself but stand up for any young girl who feels like you know they're made to feel guilty for their success or feel like they're not deserving of the things that they've achieved. If things work out the way you hope they work out, although as I say they've worked out fantastically Thank to you. this point, but but if they were, you know, the next few years were to unfold the way you hope, what will they look like? Good question. Um, I don't know. I've always been an album artist. I've always loved artists who have these like iconic albums that people remember for a long time, if not forever, and that's that's always been a dream of mine. I've always wanted to be seen as just a real songwriter and a good songwriter that has these albums that people can listen to years and years from now that will always be relevant. I think that's the dream. So whether that's five years, 10 years, 20 years, I hope that that's what people will remember me as. It's a real pleasure meeting you. Great to meet you Thank too. You very Thank much. you. Next on The National, fake news and fake views. The Fifth Estate dives into the world of artificial intelligence video fakery. If I were to suggest that we take our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau... Absolutely. And the scary part of that is we can just go to Google Images, download one of the pictures, and then um, just insert it inside uh, this app. So, wow. Mark Kelly takes us through what's out there and how to spot it. But first, for a moment today, while many were watching football, and you know you were, there was buzz about what might be a seismic event in the NFL. You see, the Cleveland Browns are looking for a new head coach, and the team's general manager, in a bit of an offhand way, said he was open to hiring a woman. So today, reports were swirling that they were looking into none other than Condoleezza Rice. Yes, that Condoleezza Rice, former U.S. National Security Advisor and Secretary of State 
under George W. Bush. Some will remember her most as one of the faces of the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. We have to be sure, as the civilized world, that Saddam Hussein is held to account. But there are many sides to Condi Rice. Turns out her devotion to football and the Cleveland Browns in particular goes way back to childhood. Football matters to me because it is first and foremost the greatest set of memories with my dad. She grew up following the intricacies of the game. She was a member of the U.S. College Football Playoff Selection Committee for years and has proudly boosted the NFL brand. There are signs pro sports is slowly changing. Women are starting to get hired in coaching and training positions. But to date, there's never been a female NFL head coach. And today, the Browns GM denied Rice is in the running. For her part, Rice says on Facebook that she isn't ready to coach, but that the NFL is ready for women coaches and that she wouldn't mind calling a play or two. Here's a look at some of the stories we're watching for this week on The National. We're going to have a report on Tuesday, and it'll be very complete. That very complete U.S. State Department report will be on the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Donald Trump has said the report will include who did it. According to The Washington Post, the CIA has already concluded Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman ordered the killing. Saudi Arabia denies that. We need to think about how we're competitive tomorrow and the day after. And then on Wednesday, Finance Minister Bill Morneau tables the federal government's fall economic statement. As part of that, Morneau is expected to reveal strategies for supporting Canadian journalism. Shrinking ad revenues have led to newspaper closures and broadcasting cutbacks. It's a really big day to have my big sister <laughs> on, on the note. And tomorrow, the $10 bill honoring Canadian civil rights pioneer Viola Desmond goes into circulation. She was arrested in 1946 for sitting in the whites only section of a Nova Scotia movie theater. Desmond's image graces the first vertical banknote. On the other side, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg. Killmonger was right. Or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place. Or, how about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. That's obviously not a message from former U.S. President Barack Obama. The voice is comedian and filmmaker Jordan Peele. The illusion, courtesy of BuzzFeed and widely available tools for manipulating video. Tools that seem to get more convincing by the day. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. So we live in a time of so-called fake news when all sorts of people want to make you believe things that simply aren't true. Tonight, we'll show you the high-tech advances taking it to a new and, frankly, frightening level. We are way past simple lies. What happens when you cannot believe your eyes? Mark Kelly is a host of CBC's The Fifth Estate. He's been investigating this sort of dangerous twist in fake news. Mark, what makes this in particular so disturbing? Well, it's incredible when we look at right now at the quality of fake video that's out there. And this is manipulated video that is really designed to deceive, to disrupt, and to destabilize. We're seeing more and more of this. It's a modern-day weapon of war. And in the hands of, of certain people can be very, very damaging. I mean, you're looking at uh, enemy states that could possess this technology, but more and more you're looking at someone in their own basement who has a grudge, a decent computer, and some basic computer computer skills. I went to a software uh, company in uh, LA. They showed us just how easy it is to create some pretty good fakes. Take a look. If I were to suggest that we take our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, could you take a picture of him and do the same thing with him? Absolutely. And the scary part of that is we can just go to Google Images, download one of the pictures, and then um, just insert it inside uh, this app. So. Wow. It instantly just built his face, right? And we are basically um, compositing this face onto his face. So totally. Jew is becoming Justin Trudeau instantly. And everything is happening in real time, live. So um, now imagine we could basically stream this video uh, to someone and have a chat conversation where someone could believe that it is Justin. 
Okay, so there's an element of this is actually quite cool, but mm -hmm. very clearly the alarm bells are, are clanging. How worried do you think people should be right now? Well, they should be worried and they should be aware. I mean, I was down in Washington where the U.S. Defense Department is spending millions of dollars right now to develop technology to be able to spot the fakes. But in, in a candid interview, they said right now, in fact, the adversaries have the upper hand. It's easier to create manipulated video, fake videos, than it is to spot it these days. So how are consumers, news consumers, uh, protected, or, or how will they be protected? From well, some major news organizations are creating, uh, you know, they're training people to be able to detect these things before they're actually broadcast or published. That's one thing. But in terms of consumers as well, I think it's, it's up to all of us to be smarter and to be a little bit more skeptical about, the, skeptical about the things we see. You know, we say this in journalism, consider the source. Where did this video actually come from? People need to question these things. But also really start relying on trusted sources. It is our job as professional journalists to get it right. Social media is good at putting that information out there, but not really good at curating it. That's our job. So consider the source and trust reliable sources. Okay, Mark Kelly, Fifth, Fifth Estate. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. You can watch Mark's full Fifth Estate doc, The Deep Fake, online. Check it out at cbc.ca slash the fifth. Next on The National, they have faced discrimination and violence. They braved the long road to Tijuana, but finally, seven LGBTQ couples fulfill their dream of getting married. We'll tell you all about it in our moment of the day. Everyone was cheering and mixed with tears of um, tears of joy. It was it was a it was a nice bright spot in what has been um, a sort of challenging month and a half. But first, let's show you a quick look at a story we have for you tomorrow on The National. Our Nick Purden takes us to a community in northern Ontario that's getting hooked up to the electrical grid for the very first time. There we go. It's hard to believe that in 2018, there are entire communities in northern Ontario that don't have reliable power. You got it. I mean, imagine living in a place where there's not enough power to hook up new houses or provide reliable health care. And there are so many blackouts, it can take up to an extra year to finish high school. But this is a story about the plan to change that. You know, I can't wait till it starts so that I can hopefully get a job on it and start working on it. You know, be able to tell my kids, you know, dad helped build that, dad helped build the power line. Amid the chaos of the now infamous caravan's arrival in Tijuana, there was a moment of hope. Seven LGBTQ couples and one straight couple were married in a symbolic ceremony. For these two, it was a dream long in the making. Freelance reporter Sarah Kanosian was there to witness the ceremony. She spoke with us about what this moment meant to the couples, and that is our moment of the day. A lot of the, you know, couples have been together a long time and they've been wanting to get married for a while and they come from countries where that's not possible. The first couple to get married was a, a gay couple who've been together almost three years. They met on Facebook. Uh, their names are Pedro and Eric. They came from Guatemala where they both were fleeing various forms of discrimination and violence. There was a lesbian couple who had met at a soccer match in Honduras. You know, they also said that they were fleeing significant discrimination, not just from their family, but from the community, and had quite a hard time getting a job because of their sexual orientation. There was one straight couple that got married, and they had just made really good friends with a portion of the LGBT group that had sort of jumped ahead of the the bigger bulk of the caravan. The group of trans women that they were friends with just didn't want to leave them behind. Everyone was cheering and mixed with tears of joy. It was it was a, a nice bright spot in what has been um, a sort of challenging month and a half. Okay, so Tijuana, uh, by the way, legalized same-sex marriage back in 2017. And these, of course, were, as they said, s symbolic marriages. It happened because the pastors had come down from Northern California. but. Eric and Pedro, who you heard about there, said that they've been worried about losing each other at the border if they get to the U.S. border. And so for them, this was uh, an attempt to maybe try to stay together, even though they admit they have no idea what's going to happen if they get there. That is a national for Sunday, November 18th. Good night.